whose reputation for substandard reliability drove it out of the North American market like it was at a house party, and Dad got home. Now, Alpha's back, with billions in investment, a brand new factory, and clean sheet designs from Ferrari engineers. But, is it any good? I fell in love with Alpha's as a kid. My dad drove a brand new Spider home one night, and I was done. It was the most beautiful car I'd ever seen. Unfortunately, I never even rode in it since that night we had a garage fire and the car burned. Not the car's fault. That was enough, though. I wanted an Alpha. Childhood dumbness aside, what I'd really like would be to replace my 987 Boxster with a new one, but my knees, back, and other practical bishnit forces me into an SUV. Which brings us to the Stelvio a car my family's put over 4,000 miles on in about three months. Unique, and in my eye, the only attractive SUV outside of Land Rover, Jaguar, or Volvo. I've owned a Land Rover, probably not doing that twice. Jag uses the same platform, and Volvo's nice, but not what I'm looking for. Never had an Alpha. An Alpha is like White Castle to me. Doesn't matter what anyone says, I want it. Mainly because I can't have it. Once I try it, that might be enough. Because attractive isn't enough. It has to drive right. I want fun. Not fun for an SUV. Fun. See, fun's a car that rotates naturally through turns, plowings for fields, and understeer kills the groove. Don't kill the groove. Shoot you at a cannon. You might say that any SUV or crossover is going to be too high for that. I say, yeah, probably. But there's a lot more to handling than low center of gravity. Weight distribution isn't just about height. Take the battery placement, rear, center. So the engineers weren't just thinking front to rear, they were thinking left to right too. They also put the battery as far back as possible while keeping the weight between the axles and leaving room for a spare. Then the accountants made the spare optional, so they suck. The base four is a new design from those fresh Ferrari engineers. Longitudinally mounted with the mass behind the front axles for optimized weight distribution. Check this. Alpha spec a panel to cover the bolts for the engine shield and attached it with a rope. Never losing that. It's important. Under that ventilated and insulated shield is an engine that looks surprisingly easy to service and repair for a modern car with a well-heat-shielded turbo that should bode well for long-term reliability of the electronics, which is good. There are a lot of electronics. 
Alpha uses a truly state-of-the-art brake-by-wire system developed by Continental Tire. It can actuate faster and stronger than traditional systems, and fully integrates with ABS and traction control. The pedal feel is funky at first, though, with Brembo, four piston calipers up front, and single piston rear brakes, the Stelvio stops reliably. Behind the brakes is the flyness though, an all aluminum front double wishbone suspension, and patented aluminum rear multi-link suspension with composite cross member, both engineered to minimize unsprung weight and maximize the size of the tire's contact patch in all conditions while maintaining steering angle regardless of suspension travel. This allows the Stelvio to handle better than 8 inches of ground clearance would make you think, since the tire's grip on the road is always optimized front and rear. It also gives the all-wheel drive system a lot to work with, utilizing a true torque vectoring center differential and fully integrated into all the car's systems using software developed by Magneti Morelli. Alpha's Q4 system is more than the sum of its parts. You can't really mention Alfa Romeo without mentioning Magneti Morelli. Magneti Morelli is, to simplify things, Alfa Romeo's parts company. They equipped the first Alfa Romeo to race in and win a Formula One Grand Prix. It also was the first Formula One Grand Prix. They're also huge in the World Rally Championship. They equip all-wheel drive systems, they equip the safety systems, they invented the first sequential gearbox transmission. And I believe that every manufacturer that makes a sequential gearbox from BMW to Volkswagen, uh, they're all getting parts from Magneti Morelli. This expertise in componentry and their integration was used to make the Q4 system a predictive part-time all-wheel drive, a 100% rear-wheel drive system that can transfer up to 60% of the power to the front wheels and around 100 to 150 milliseconds. The software monitors various sensors to predict traction and directional stability loss and shifts power as needed. It allows for a good amount of mechanical overslip, which seamlessly combines with the traction control to keep power going to whichever wheels have the most traction. Even with one wheel on each axle slipping, something that'll stop many all-wheel drive systems with open differentials in the tracks only slows the Stelvio down a little bit. A lot of people have said that this is not really an off-road car. It doesn't have an off-road setting. Here's my question. If it's built by one of the companies, dominant in rally racing, does it need an off-road setting? The car has three drive modes, dynamic, natural, and advanced efficiency. Cause one of them needs a stupid name. On or off-road, they adjust the car's systems to suit your preferred driving style. I like that you can go from pavement to dirt or dry to wet and not have to press a button. You can just enjoy driving. And each mode really affects how the car drives, but none of them turn off traction control, so for the most part they all work well regardless of conditions. Dynamic is aggressive and super fun. The steering and brakes are sharper, and the engine wants to yell. The transmission holds gears till redline and would rather downshift than upshift. The traction control and all-wheel drive systems allow more slip from the rear wheels before activating, too. It makes the engine burn gas like it's getting rid of evidence, and you might get on a first-name basis with the local law enforcement, but you will be smiling the entire time, and that's what matters, right? Natural mode tames things down. You can still have fun, but you can get decent gas mileage and the car doesn't have the overwhelming need to go fast. Seriously, in dynamics, it's like the car's angry with you for not accelerating. This is not your accountant's SUV. Advanced efficiencies your high gas mileage or really bad traction in weather mode. It sets the traction control to high and engine responsiveness to low. And it does a great job of getting through bad weather or rough terrain and giving you gas mileage likes on the window sticker. Off-road, it makes the gas and brakes easy to modulate, but really, it's responsible mode. Is the Stelvio built to go off-road? I think it is. I think when Alfa Romeo says, we don't see a lot of 
demand for off-road driving in the luxury class. But if you want to, you can. They don't have an English accent, they're Italian, but whatever. Kind of being like Rolls-Royce used to be with their power. They didn't tell you how much horsepower the engine made. They just said it was sufficient. Was sufficient to go off-road? Yeah, absolutely. That's not to say you should go rock crawling in it. The Stelvio would be wasted on that. The ambient lighting inside and out, satin aluminum trim, start button, on the steering wheel, and the flowing uncluttered design? No, it's not for rock crawling expeditions. The overall interior quality, textures, materials, and controls are more classic than modern. We think that feels special. Like every car, there are cost savings. The joystick shifter is the cheapest feeling thing in the car, which is really sad. We suggest the sport package with badass column mounted paddle shifters if you want to do the shifting yourself. The 8-speed transmission is one of the best. That shifter though. Otherwise, the interior is a great place to be with plenty of head, leg, and elbow room. Anyone much over six feet might find the back small. It's comfortable though, and there are multiple cup holders for every seat, four fast charge USB ports, and bag hooks in the back. The Harman Kardon system is warm and neutral. You can tell it wasn't designed for bass heavy music though. The infotainment system does what it's supposed to. The backup camera is crap. You can pair multiple phones, Bluetooth, and set their priority. Access music, it'll read you a text, tell you the oil level and tire pressure. It even has the owner's manual in it. The graphics are simple, but they won't distract or tire out your eyes at night. It uses a rotary knob, not a touch screen, which we prefer. However, like the shifter, it feels cheap. It is perfectly placed next to the driver mode and volume controls, but cheap feeling. The center console is very solid though, and has a wide padded leather armrest and an AC vent in the storage compartment for chilled candy. This isn't a car that exists to give you the latest in entertainment features. It exists to give you a classic driving experience, which is its own entertainment. However, the newest build of the Stelvio does include Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. Just make sure you see it on the window sticker. The base model seats are comfortable with subtly contrasting stitching and high quality leather that's breaking in well. They also have embossed alpha logos on the headrests. The key is large, but it has the same shapes as the hood, so it's cool. It's also designed to easily replace the battery, something most manufacturers act like you'll never do. The back of the key has lock, unlock, power lift, gate, remote start, and a stupid large panic button. For real, why do we even have that button? I hate that button. Once the engine starts, the way it drives just makes everything else good and bad seem unimportant. It has a carbon fiber drive shaft, which along with the lightweight all-wheel drive components, creates a very efficient drivetrain allowing the engine to rev incredibly fast. It feels happy ripping through the rev band. And the transmission loves it just as much. It was programmed to feel like a sequential, even though it's a traditional auto, so the gear changes are smooth, but noticeable and incredibly fast. Manual shifting's way more rewarding than most autos. Wish we had the paddle shifters now. At least I don't wish we got the upgraded headlights. There aren't any. Even this base model has adaptive HID lights that are bright, wide, and turned with the steering wheel. So they're pointing where you're going even through turns, and they work so well from the driver's seat they're almost unnoticeable other than you can always see the road ahead of you. At highway speeds, in pitch black, the lights work so well you never feel like you can't see, which helps to keep the Stelvio feeling safe at night. Since the headlights are wide enough to illuminate the shoulder of the road and the lane next to you, these headlights should be considered mandatory safety equipment. It's a little ridiculous how much better they are than the headlights on most cars. They're probably the best standard headlights in the industry in terms of brightness, and being able to see and be seen only makes driving easier and safer. 
Let's talk about safety for a second. Safety is more than electronic nannies. Safety is the driver paying attention to what they're doing. And the fact of the matter is, if you enjoy what you're driving, you're going to pay attention. If you don't enjoy driving the Stelvio, you don't have a pulse. Driving the Stelvio is a joy. The cornering's easy and neutral. Even with mid-corner bumps and dips, the suspension takes it without upsetting the steering. Transitioning through S-turns, accelerating out of a corner or down a straightaway is effortless. It's hard not to see the cars ahead of you as something to pass or roadblocks. The Stelvio is one of those rare cars that kind of disappears. It's just you and the road and some dumb hole driving slow in the fast lane. See, those crazy engineers specified aluminum front and rear frames, front shock towers, brakes, suspension, doors, fenders, hood, and roof. This combined with the engine placement and overall layout essentially centers the Stelvio's mass between the axles. From the driver's seat, it makes the car feel less like a horseman of the carpocalypse and more like a resistance fighter for vehicular freedom. If you ever take it off pavement, everything that works so well on road keeps working just as well. The parking sensors do a good job of letting you know if the hill's too steep and the base suspension's firm but not punishing even with 20 inch rims, although the base 18s would be better. Body motions are controlled, and the car always tracks straight. On very loose surfaces, the traction control can aggressively cut in and stop the fun short, but it keeps the vehicle moving forward up to the limits of the tires reliably. Right now we have on the stock Continental, so we're not doing anything like rocky trails till we can get a better wheel and tire combo. Still, it does better on loose rutted roads and hills than some supposed off-road vehicles. Always tracking straight when you want and turning when you need. The all-wheel drive system can drag a wheel when necessary, which makes it crazy responsive to steering inputs in sand and mud, and helps to keep the rear tires tracking close to the front, which is exactly what you want in tight spaces. The real limits the suspension articulation. It doesn't take much to get wheels off the ground. However, the car's natural balance and the well-executed all-wheel drive manage to keep things moving without ever feeling out of control. You can see this as we drive up this loose hill with alternating holes, so only one wheel on each axle will have traction. You can see the first time a wheel lifts, it trips the Q4 system a little bit. Then it figures out what's happening, and it's at the top. Now bring that back in slow-mo. Now you can see how the system can entirely stop or slow down individual wheels to shuffle power around and get the car moving. How the weight balance allows the wheels to lift and come back down without crashing. And how the suspension can go from full compression to full extension at different corners without getting bouncy. There probably isn't another SUV at this price on the market whose base suspension and all-wheel drive system will take this type of use and stay this composed. Even the upgraded or off-road suspensions might not do as well. Here we have the same hill going down using the hill descent control at 4 miles an hour. Controlled, smooth, and stable, it's at least as good as Land Rover's system, maybe better since the brake-by-wire system and the Stelvio can modulate the brakes smoother, and the ABS doesn't make the same type of grinding sounds. It also doesn't create kickback at the pedal, making emergency braking easier. The system allows the car to stop predictably on loose and uneven surfaces, even better on split surfaces like two wheels on dirt and two on asphalt, Stelvio acts like nothing's even happening. On or off-road, quadrifolio or base model, I must say the Stelvio is one of the best driving vehicles on the market, not for an SUV, for a vehicle. 
Is Alfa Romeo going to be reliable? Yeah, I think it will be. This doesn't mean we expect perfection. We just think it'll be as reliable as its competitors. My E46 BMW 330Ci had the stereo and driver's side taillight go out three times, and I only kept that for six months. VW EOS VR6 had the AC and DSG transmission go out enough times to lemon. Land Rover LR3 had the ignition brake. It wasn't my thing dynamically. Volvo XC90, fuel pump and all-wheel drive issues. 987 Boxster, flawless for 50,000 miles, except for the winter when the battery froze, and the hood latch is electric, and the emergency release broke when I pulled it. So the car sat for three months till it thawed and I could safely put on a battery tender that charged the car through the power socket. Oh, and the $2,000 brake job at 20,000 miles sucked. So basically, our hope is it's at least as good or better than a bunch of other cars that are all not entirely that reliable. Lowered expectations. <laughs> not really. I fully expect it to start and go into gear every time it's used. Sensors and software have issues, and most of the Stelvio's competitors use and rely more on these things than the Stelvio does, and they all basically use the same suppliers. So really, I expect it to be reliable. With a little over 4,000 miles on it, I actually expected it to have some sort of electronic or other issue already, but so far so good. Even during the summer with temperatures outside over 110, there have been no issues. This is why we go off-road, by the way. Fresh tortoise, dude. I wanted to leave him a skateboard and some pizza. Name him Raph. People are like, no, he's wildlife. You gotta leave him alone. So I did. Let's not get things twisted. The Stelvio is not something you want to take on the Rubicon Trail. However, it can easily handle bad weather or an off-the-beaten-path adventure as well as it handles a tight, twisty mountain road or a long stretch on a crowded highway with enough practicality thrown in to make sure everyone and everything you want can come along for the ride. This vehicle isn't for everyone either, but if your idea of fun is experiencing the drive, it may be for you. The freshness and the foolishness should be self-explanatory, unless you're foolish. Can't help you then. Everything considered, the pros destroy the cons. We love this vehicle. Nothing's perfect, and we'll see if it's still like this in a couple of years. But currently, this is my favorite car ever. Puts me in a good mood every time I see it. More people should drive an Alpha. Might make the world a happier place. Maybe they drive better. Could you imagine?